uh, Balboas. Okay. Make sure you have a set. Six. Hi. Hi. How's your world, Pierre? Good, thanks. Okay. Thomas Taylor, of course. And therefore, you can work back and forth with it. Um, <clears throat> the basic idea of what you're looking at, uh, just quickly, um, <clears throat> Anything, anything that is all, every, everything that has life has three things. It has a mode of existence. And in order to have a mode of existence, at least it has to have the power, an internal power, of keeping all of its parts together, at least. It may also have the power to extend to other things or to affect other things. But in any case, if it has existence, therefore it must have power. And if it has existence and power, then it has power to do something, some activity. Now that's basically the, the entire work. Now, it, what's curious though is that um, you can focus on existence just by itself. And therefore, let me just put it this way. I, I'll use this, I just want to talk about existence itself. And, I mean, just to have existence presupposes uh, it must have some power. And uh, just pure existence must have some activity. In other words, this is capable of looking like this. You can say, the activity has an existence, the activity has a power. You can talk about an activity purely having an activity. So you can use this triad again and again, and that's the basic structure uh, that Proclus employs. Now, um, this, is, this is only in respect to the intelligible. All right, now, what the heck does that mean? Um, if it is possible, if it is possible to experience pure existence or being, see, we've raised it a step. Well, he's going to call this the intelligible. And you can't have an intelligible unless there is some, some activity of the intelligible because it's going to follow this model. There is the I, the C, er, yeah. the seeing, the seeing. So, um, that's the intelligible. The seeing is a is combining both. So he calls this the uh, intellectual intelligible.
And here he, he changes it, but often he just calls it seeing, that it, the seer as either intellect or intelligence, the activity of the intellect. Now, if one has a, one of these great experiences, mystical experiences, then one is encountering something that one thinks is, in some way, is intelligible. That is to say, there's something about it that has mind. Right? It's not dumb. <laughs> and there must have been some activity that led to it. So you could really write it, the uh, intellect or intelligence is intellecting or what he calls the intellectual intelligible So the intellect is intellecting the pure intelligible. <clears throat> and that's where he gets this. Right. Now, here's the problem. In in the in the experience itself, what is disclosed? But what terms most indicate that experience or describe it or can represent it? <coughs> that becomes the vocabulary. Now the problem with the vocabulary it's both descriptive, but the terms themselves, right, the vocabulary themselves can be analyzed, and you can see logically that some become before others, and some are presupposed, etc. So then, once you get the vocabulary, you can hierarchically present it, right? Hierarchically, right? Right, the greatest or most profound to the least. And this is reflection. Reflection puts them in the hierarchy. Assumption. This reflection into these categories really reflects the vocabulary, but once you see it, it should most ideally describe that experience and and should allow you to see even more fully the very nature of what it is you experience. That's the game. So this is what he's done and the Balboas put this out and therefore if you find it useful please look it over. And I thought, did you, yeah, what do you I was wondering if you could fill out the vocabulary since you've gotten this far. What? <laughs> if you could just proliferate, book, proliferate and elaborate upon the no, mystical you vocabulary. No, you do. Well, write a book. I got one. Go ahead. Effulgent. Oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, they're dynamic terms. Effulgent. Yeah, effulgent, yeah. luminosity. As well as... Go ahead, what's the other word? Effulgent luminosity. Okay. Ah, oh, come on. Distinctive. Do or better. Discriminating Do better. terms of the subject. Okay. <laughs> I'm okay. sorry, am I interrupting? Okay. So you can put here unfolding. Unfolding. <clears throat> you can put in here uh, oneness, beauty, uh, being. Okay. And 
once you get these terms, then you can say, hey, you know what, some may be said to belong to others, and others are presupposed either before it or after it, and they all fit together, and you can arrange them hierarchically. Right. Unity. Right. Likeness. Yeah. 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 Okay. Done, sir. What is the contrary class to dynamic? Is it static? Well, I wanted a static term. He was using a dynamic term. So I said, let's just make it descriptive of, of what is uh, um, static. That's what, okay. Between dynamic and static. I, I don't like the word static, but that's all I could come up with. Got a better one? Stasis. Hypostasis. <clears throat> Pardon me? Hypostasis. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, <clears throat> of course, behind this is a whole Greek tradition of thought. And Proclus is the last one, the second to the last one. Oh, you know, Reese. Okay, fair enough. I can take it off. Go ahead. Beauty. Being but, um, <clears throat> this is also a way of understanding it or the Phaedrus in terms of its metaphysics because that's what you end up with a metaphysical view of the Phaedrus All right. and that's useful um, Now you can uh, you can obviously use it, but you might want to add more to it than just the metaphysics. So, wouldn't you agree that um, <clears throat> it's a good time for reading? Now, I didn't get a chance to ask Barbara earlier, so just consider this a private communication between us. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You did enjoy the section on the description of the soul in the Phaedrus. Immortality of the soul. Right, in our last talk. Immortality. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you might tonight, if, as you go into it, you might gain <clears throat> a couple of insights you want to share. <clears throat> I'd be happy to share them. It's just, I, I actually went over it again and oh. ended up with more questions and puzzles oh. about what the nature of a of that as a proof is, mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's really intriguing and, and beautiful, but I think it's very Hellenic and... Mm. Um, Let's... Hellenic. Do it. Okay. Especially with that last thought, it's really Hellenic, yeah. which and means, of course, it. it was created in hell. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah, well. Animologically or something like that? <clears throat> okay. Hot. So I'd, be, I'd be happy to share the, the puzzle. Yes, please, the please. Well, not right. I mean, Ready? We got a reader? Yeah. <clears throat> He's a, a copy if anyone's got it. Please. Anyone have an extra copy? I have a Thomas Taylor that you're welcome to use. Although I feel like shedding a tear and party with you. Thanks, sir. And Tony? Is that one of these two? This is weird, so. Okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Last thought. As you look over your sheets, they should have seven sheets when you have a whole set complete. So. Seven sheets. Um, <clears throat> 244 to 250 is a section, has subdivisions, but he breaks it into, this section is the section on madness, divine madness, the fourth kind of madness. <clears throat> so uh, we may not get that far, but that's our goal. All right, so we'll take that as a unit. 244 to 250, <clears throat> enumerating the kinds. Um, and he goes, therefore, into the paragraph 
all these noble results of inspired madness I can mention and many more. All right, that's a 245B and the lobe 469. Okay, want to pick it up from there? Daniel, you on it? 214, page 469. All the noble results. 245B. Okay. All these noble results of inspired madness I can mention and many more. Therefore, let us not be afraid on that point and let no one disturb and frighten us by saying that the reasonable friend should be referred to him who is in a frenzy. Let him show in addition that love is not sent from heaven for the advantage of lover and beloved alike, and we will grant him the prize of victory. We on our, por on our part must prove that such madness is given by the gods for our greatest happiness, and our proof will not be believed by the merely clever, but will be accepted by the truly wise. First, then, we must learn the truth about the soul, divine and human, by observing how it acts and is acted upon. And the beginning of our proof is as follows. Every soul is immortal, for that which is ever moving is immortal. But that which moves something else or is moved by something else, when it ceases to move, ceases to live. Only that which moves itself, since it does not leave itself, never ceases to move. And this is also the source and beginning of motion for all other things which have motion. But the beginning is ungenerated. For everything that is generated <clears throat> must be generated from a beginning. But the beginning is not generated from anything. For if the beginning were generated from anything, it would not be generated from a beginning. And since it is ungenerated, it must, also, must be also indestructible. For if the beginning were destroyed, could never be generated from anything, nor anything else from it, since all things must be generated from a beginning. Thus, that which moves itself must be the beginning of motion. And this can be neither destroyed nor generated, otherwise all the heavens and all generation must fall in ruin and stop and never again have any source of motion or origin. But since that which is moved by itself has been seen to be immortal, one who says that this self-motion is the essence and the very idea of the soul will not be disgraced. For every body which derives motion from without is soulless. But that which has its motion within itself has a soul, since that is the nature of the soul. But if this is true, that that which moves itself is nothing else than the soul, then the soul would necessarily be ungenerated and immortal. Barbara, could you uh, share something with us on this? <clears throat> hmm. Okay, well, one of the things I was puzzled about, you might say, was, um, oh, I don't know. Okay, I'll offer it, and you can let me know what you think of it. Um, <laughs> okay, do you see the sentence that says, thus that which moves itself must be the beginning of motion? Yes. I... I, that's the conclusion, right? That which moves itself must be the beginning. At least it, it looks like, in, in essence, it must be. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure why, can I say, why is it, 
I guess I don't see how that's the conclusion at that point. But that must be primary to him. And of course, it, it leads to the second, this line of reasoning, which is, but since that which is moved by itself has been seen to be immortal. Right? But since that which is moved by itself has been seen to be immortal. And I, and I understand that follows from the, the lines in between. One who says that this self-motion is the essence and the very <coughs> logos of the soul will not be disgraced. I guess I wonder what that piece is doing, Pierre. I mean, is that a fair question? I, I wondered what, at the fact that they call it the essence and the logos of the soul. And my question goes like this. So is this a, an example of what a logos is? A lo Self-motion is the essence and the logos of the soul. Well then, what a very strange thing a logos is, it seems to me. Mm. So those were the kind of things that I was talking about that I was kind of puzzled at. Like, and the third thing that I think I mentioned to you actually is in the first line, which is where it says, every soul is immortal, but that which is ever moving is immortal. And I said to myself, the first line of the soul about uh, 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 proof about immortality includes the idea of something that is always moving. What do they mean by motion? Uh, I, I don't know that. Let me, let me just finish the, the question I had. So always moving contains the idea of always, right? And uh, always by necessity, it seems to me, doesn't allow for coming into being or passing out of being if you take it strictly. So it's kind of a curious... Um, uh, thing to adduce, thing to bring into this argument at this mm -hmm. point. Um, and it just seems to me curiosity piled upon curiosity, because then they say, but that which moves itself, that which moves something else or is moved by something else when it ceases to move, leave, ceases to live. How does that come to be the case? Do you understand that only in terms of um, body in, in the section that follows it. Mm -hmm. So is it that soul is taking us, that which moves something else or is moved by something else. So if you supply, for example, body, body moves something else. Body, according to this, is moved by soul. So body cannot be considered, um, and, and certainly when it ceases to move, it does cease to, cease to live, right? So, uh, I just kind of, w but then you have to supply that to that, to that line, you know? You have to mm -hmm. supply that context to it. Mm -hmm. Or hold it in your mind as a question, what are you referring to here? Um, and then it says, only that which moves itself, since it does not leave itself, never ceases to move. Right? Well, how is it the case that if something... Uh, moves other, that that's a kind of leaving of yourself, or leaving of itself, right? Is, and and if, if you have propolis, you take propolis, and then you have the idea of, um, uh, what's that called? Uh, pr producing, you have like a, uh, you have the activity, you have the activity of the thing, right? That could be considered a kind of leaving in generation, but are we to assume that here? So, and so it says, and this is a source of beginning of motion for all other things which have motion. Well, taking the, the, the line above that, you can see that something which moves something else or is moved by something else, um, that which, they, they, they have, they are either source or, or, the area, the, the actor, that which is acted upon following that structure. So can you see the kind of puzzles I was looking at? And, and I found it, but I found it very beautiful. You know, it's not that I didn't find it beautiful, but I just kept saying to myself, why is this line here where it is? What does it require for me to understand it? And yet it seemed to hold together, especially the further you get into it. The argument about generation, I don't see a problem with. I don't know if anybody else does. But that, you know... Other people? Come on, quick. No. Yeah. Welcome. Just 
what is meant by motion and moving? Is it just change? Is there an analogy for any kind of change? I think any kind of, well, Oh, you mean like change in space, or change in quality, or change? Change in any kind of quality or attribute? Is that what's meant by motion or movement? Things that have kinetic energy in them? Motion, right? Like he says, you know, things that are moved by themselves, things that are moved by others, things that are moved by others and move other things. I get this kind of the Parmenides gives uh, a, a, idea, right? A, a cashing out of motion. What motion is? Right? Oh, okay. I haven't read it in a while, but yeah, I'm assuming so. Rest motion, being alteration. It can't just be and, movement. And change of place. Yeah, it can. alteration and change of place. I think. Alteration and change of place. How, how can it literally be your book? It cannot move unless it's moved. It has no inner life, no inner force. And I think this basically is a concept of inner force to motion, make motion. The body has no motion of itself. It's the soul that moves it. So it's, it's hmm. what's meant by it is change, really. Well, right. time is the change. Is that is that what we want to refer to? We're referring to simple motion. Now, wouldn't you agree that the body, once it's laid out and no longer moves, is devoid of motion? It's also devoid of its soul. So therefore, the idea that we the soul is here, it motivates the body, it moves the body. The body doesn't move unto itself, it's promoted by the soul's motion. So is motion considered life? So without life, I would think motion. it's a good word for it, wouldn't you? Would you not agree that motion within a, within a living being so is life? So if you have motion, you would be alive. Yeah, yeah. Well, motion in a living being is life. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Living. Yeah. That's what living is. Well, what because the first statement is every soul is immortal. So it's <coughs> talking about life. Really? Yeah. Am I dead when I sit down still? No, because you're breathing, you're functioning, your brain and mind. Mm -hmm. and so everything life. else is moving. But what about gravity and planets? I mean, they, they have motion. Are they alive? Well, she's in the time man. <clears throat> Obviously. Um, I'd like to add to that question. What moves? Uh, and and ask not only what moves, but what is the range of motion? Is it just, are we talking about living beings? Are we talking about the universe? Are we talking about everything that depends on the one? Um, are we just are we just talking about a book that moves around? Um, is, uh, when we say, you know, there's one thing that doesn't move, or there's one <coughs> thing that moves, all other things, what is the range of the yeah. movement? That's a great question. What That's is right. motion? What are we talking right. about when we talk about something that moves other things? How, you know, is it this whole pro this whole thing That's here? Right. Is that all motion? That's right. That's right. That's right. So, absolutely. Right. So, that's the issue. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, that's the whole speech. Mm -hmm. The soul has got a self motion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what you're pointing out is quite correct. This speech, therefore, takes it after death. We like that. It's all after death. Has nothing to do with soul and body. The whole speech is after death. And he's going to draw. He's going to draw material for contrast. That's true. But the journey of the soul is all after death. <clears throat> and the <laughs> self-motion. And the point you're raising is quite true. To what? Yeah. And normally, when we talk about the soul, we talk about it. It's not going to move unless it has a plan. It doesn't move at random. And it doesn't move unless its plan brings about some benefit to itself because the soul has a care of itself. None of that is in here. It's just self-motion. So, and it starts with a plural. Right? Every soul. And it ends with soul. The soul. So it moves from a plurality to the soul. 
embracing, therefore, all things that have life. And what do you do, too, with the paragraph that says, for everybody which de derives motion from without is soulless, mm -hmm. but that which has its motion within itself has a soul, mm -hmm. since that is the nature of the soul. So that, so that there, are, there are bodies which derive motion from without, but those bodies are called soulless. Mm -hmm. And then there are bodies which have the motion within themselves, they call so does he literally mean that some people can be considered soulless if they derive their motion from without? Or does he mean simply that? No, that's, that's contrasting, but he doesn't, it is not, he is not going to explore the body without a soul. Hmm. He's making that point to talk about the fact that the motion has to be within the soul. Hmm. No. And it's a special kind of motion because he, he's not really talking about the body in motion through the motion of the soul, but the soul's motion in and of itself. Yeah, well, if we want to stay with this, um, you have to go into that curious word usia, don't you? Mm -hmm. Right? Because it's a certain kind of motion that turns upon itself. Mm -hmm. He didn't... He didn't have to use that word, Usia, right? right. Turns on itself. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. The self motion is, is a essence, Usia. Mm -hmm. And the very idea of the soul will not be disgraced. If someone says that the self motion is this, it turns upon itself. Mm -hmm. If it turns upon itself, then it knows itself and it knows the condition it's in, and therefore it can now proceed. Mm -hmm. But it has to start from us. That's what they call M. Suke, right? Yes. Well, I, I, what I was fascinated by was the, the English is kind of burdensome. They say it's um, they say it's has a soul, right? But but the Greek is actually more like in in soul, right? Mm -hmm. Right, which mm -hmm. doesn't have that division, right? Mm -hmm. So. Oh. See, um, mm -hmm. well, what if we were to say that um, the self-motion, this kind of self-motion, has no beginning? Mm -hmm. This kind of motion has no beginning or end. It's always in motion. It's always in motion. And when it's in man, it can be in the soul. Mm -hmm. Ah. Ah. So, uh, mm. we're going to see more of the implications of that curious view of the motion, because that's a different kind of motion, right? Reflecting upon oneself. And that's what's in, in, implicit in the idea of usia, the capability to turn upon oneself. That's awesome. Yeah. Sir? That's awesome. Is that great? Yeah. Yes, it's awesome for Usia. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Turning upon the self. Yeah. 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 To know the self. Oh. I just have a quick question. Wow. Barbara. <clears throat> okay. All right. Cool. All right. Should we push for the major next sentence? One quick question. Um, what, is, what does the word principle in the Taylor add to what he was... Because he uses principle. Rather than source. I can't even I can't even put it together, but he's using. Um, Do you want to see it, Well, no. Yes. Exactly. Would you read the sentence? Beginning. It's it's the whole. It's the whole paragraph. All right, go ahead. Where I don't see what the parallel the I don't see the parallel between principle. What part are you in, in the in, in the Taylor? And the same in the in the low. The read a sentence that, that has it. The, word it, it. the whole paragraph has it. Read read yeah. it, read one sentence that does have it. Um, How about everything that is generated must be generated from a principle, or everything that comes into being must come into being from a principle? Yeah. Is yeah. that is that what he's okay. about? 
Um, mm -hmm. Or pick any sentence yeah, that's but most baffling to you. Know, for everything that's just generated is necessary. Uh, for neither could it any longer be a principle mm -hmm. if it were generated from external costs, since it, since then it is unbegotten and it's also arcane. 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 That's where the it's principle he uses arcane rule. Pegging. Beginning. Beginning. Source. Principle. So okay, so See, he uses I've known it's very important. Yeah, yeah beginning because. principle. In the, okay. in the first paragraph, I think the the reason why the law hmm. might have gone with um, source, although you have to remember, rather with beginning, is that you have is that but is that uh, in the very first paragraph it was only that which moves itself since it does not leave itself, never never ceases to move, and this is also the source and beginning. Mm -hmm. The word for source there is a different word. It's like literally the source of water. Spring. You know, the fountain, right. And Spring. Taylor uses fountain. The fountain. Yeah. And so, uh, but but I think it's really worthwhile to remember that this word RK can mean, right, can have the idea of principle that generates, right, as well as beginning. So a generating principle, you follow? Yeah. So I think I, we I need those levels to keep those layers. Than the beginning. Ah. <coughs> So the argument flows for you with principle? Yeah, it sounds and, better yeah, with principle than it does with beginning, because beginning imposes all kinds of time things that don't really I like seem to exist. No. 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 They would keep both of those ideas going together, right. since we pull both of those out of one word. Again? Principle and beginning. Uh -huh. They would see both of those in the same Greek word. Mm. Oh, really? No. Yes. Okay. Is, is, are you saying that pege, arche, the yeah. spring and the principle, yeah. that, that's like a metaphysical trope that stays on through time? I thought he was saying arche as principle and beginning, uh, as having those two levels of meaning. Oh, okay. Arche is principle and beginning. Is that what you yeah. said? Okay. I thought, well, like that word, I was just thinking that word, I thought you said that the, the spring and the arche, those go together, but that was my idea. Like... Okay, they're, they're commonly break. associated, like in, in Aristotle, okay. for example. I'm good. Okay. Big. You're up. I'm up? Yeah, loud, though. Turn the volume up, please. Okay. Well, just continue where he left off, I guess? No, 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 no. Turn the volume up. Continue where he left off? Yes, concerning. <laughs> um, um, I have the tailor, I guess. Oh, okay. Then, Daniel, why don't you keep up? Concerning the immortality of the soul, this is enough. But about its form, we must speak in the following manner. To tell what it really is would be a matter for utterly superhuman and long discourse. But it is within human power to describe it briefly in a figure. Let us therefore speak in it in that way. We will liken the soul to the composite nature of a pair of winged horses and a charioteer. Now the horses and charioteers of the gods are all good and of good descent, but those of other races are mixed. And first the charioteer of the human soul drives a pair, and secondly one of the horses is noble and of noble breed but the other quite the opposite in breed and character. Therefore, in our case, the driving is necessarily difficult and troublesome. Now we must try to tell why a living being is called mortal or immortal. Soul, considered collectively, has the care of all that which is soulless, and it traverses the whole heaven, appearing sometimes in one form and sometimes in another. Now when it is perfect and fully winged, it mounts upward and governs the whole world. But the soul, which has lost its wings, is borne along until it gets hold of something solid. When it settles down, taking upon itself an earthly body, which seems to be self-moving because of the power of the soul within it. And the whole, compounded of soul and body, is called a living being and is further designated as mortal. 
It is not immortal by any reasonable supposition, but we, though we have never seen or rightly conceived a god, imagine an immortal being which has both a soul and a body which are united for all time. Let that, however, in our words concerning it, be as is pleasing to God. We will now consider the reason why the soul loses its wings. It is something like this. The natural function of the wing is to soar upwards and carry that which is heavy up to the place where dwells the race of the gods. More than any other thing that pertains to the body, it partakes of the nature of the divine. But the divine is beauty, wisdom, goodness, and all such qualities. By these, then, the wings of the soul are nourished and grow. But by the opposite qualities, such as vileness and evil, they are wasted away and destroyed. Now the great leader in heaven, Zeus, driving a winged chariot, goes first, arranging all things and caring for all things. He, he is, has no horses. Mm -hmm. Go on. Mm -hmm. chariot. He is followed by an army of gods and spirits, arrayed in eleven squadrons. Estia alone remains in the house of the gods. Of the rest, those who are included among the twelve great gods and are accounted leaders are assigned each to his place in the army. There are many blessed sights and many ways hither and thither within the heaven along which the blessed gods go to and fro, attending each to his own duties. And whoever wishes and is able follows. For jealousy is excluded from the celestial band. But when they go to a feast and a banquet, they proceed steeply upward to the top of the vault of heaven, where the chariots of the gods, whose well-matched horses obey the rain, advance easily but the others with difficulty. For the horse of evil nature weighs the chariot down, making it heavy, and pulling toward the earth the charioteer whose horse is not well trained. There the utmost toil and struggle await the soul. For those that are called immortal, when they reach the top, pass outside and take their place on the outer surface of the heaven. And when they have taken their stand, <coughs> the revolution carries them round, and they behold the things outside of the heaven. But the region above the heaven was never worthily sung by any earthly poet, <laughs> nor will it ever be. It is, however, as I shall tell. For I must dare to speak the truth, especially as truth is my theme. For the colorless, formless, and intangible, truly existing essence, which all true knowledge is concerned, holds this region and is visible only to the mind, the pilot of the soul. Now, the divine intelligence since it is nurtured on mind and pure knowledge and the intelligence of every soul which is capable of receiving that which befits it, rejoices in seeing reality for a space of time and by gazing upon truth is nourished and made happy until the revolution brings it again to the same place. In the revolution, it beholds absolute justice, temperance, and knowledge. Not such knowledge as has a beginning and varies as it is associated with 
one or another of the things we call realities, but that which abides in the real, eternal, absolute. And in the same way it beholds and feeds upon the other eternal verities, after which, passing down again within the heaven, it goes home. And there the charioteer puts up the horses at the manger and feeds them with ambrosia and then gives them nectar to drink. Such is the life of the gods, but of the other souls, that which best follows after God and is most like him, raises the head of the charioteer up into the outer region and is carried round in the revolution troubled by the horses and hardly beholding the realities. And another sometimes rises and sometimes sinks, and because its horses are unruly, it sees some things and fails to see others. The other souls follow after, all yearning for the upper region, but unable to reach it, and are carried round beneath trampling upon and colliding with one another, each striving to pass its neighbor. So there is the greatest confusion and sweat of rivalry, wherein many are lamed and many wings are broken through the incompetence of the drivers. And after much toil, they all go away without gaining a view of reality. And when they have gone away, they feed upon opinion. But the reason of the great eagerness to see where the plane of truth is lies in the fact that the fitting pasturage for the best part of the soul is in the meadow there. And the wing on which the soul is raised up is nourished by this. And this is the law of destiny. That the soul which follows after God and obtains a view of any of the truths is free from harm until the next period. And if it can always attain this, is always unharmed. But when, through inability to follow, it fails to see and through some mischance is filled with forgetfulness and evil and grows heavy, and when it has grown heavy, loses its wings and falls to the earth, then it is the law that this soul, this soul shall never pass into any beast at its first birth, but the soul that has seen the most shall enter into the birth of a man who is to be a philosopher or a lover of beauty or one of a musical or loving nature. And the second soul into that of a lawful king or a warlike ruler, and the third into that of a politician or a man of business or a financier, the fourth into that of a hard-working gymnast or one who will be concerned with the cure of the body, and the fifth will lead the life of a prophet or someone who conducts mystic rites, to the sixth a poet or some other imitative artist will be united, to the seventh, a craftsman or a husbandman, to the eighth, a sophist or a demagogue, to the ninth, a tyrant. Now in all these states, whoever lives justly obtains a better lot, whoever li and whoever lives unjustly, a worse. For each soul returns to the place whence it came in ten thousand years. For it does not regain its wings before that time has elapsed, except the soul of him who has been a guileless philosopher or a philosophical lover. These, when for three successive periods of a thousand years they have chosen such a life, after the third period of a thousand years become winged in the three thousandth year and go their way. But the rest, when they have finished their first life, receive judgment. And after the judgment, some go to the places of correction under the earth 
and pay their penalty, while the others, made light and raised up into a heavenly place by justice, live in a manner worthy of the life they led in human form. But in the thousandth year, both come to draw lots and choose their second life, each choosing whatever it wishes. Then a human soul may pass into the life of a beast, and a soul which was once human may pass again from a beast into a man. For the soul which has never seen the truth can never pass into human form. For a human being must understand a general conception formed by collecting into a unity by means of reason the many perceptions of the senses. And this is a recollection of those things which our soul once beheld when it journeyed with God and lifting its vision above the things which we now say exist, rose up into real being. And therefore it is just that the, it is just that the mind of the philosopher only has wings. For he is always, so far as he is able, in communion through memory with those things, the communion with which causes God to be divine. Let me read that again. And therefore it is just that the mind of the philosopher only has wings. For he is always, so far as he is able, in communion through memory with those things, the communion with which causes God to be divine. Now a man who employs such memories rightly is always being initiated into perfect mysteries and he alone becomes truly perfect. But since he separates himself from human interests and turns his attention toward the divine, he is rebuked by the vulgar, who consider him mad and do not know that he is inspired. All my discourse so far has been about the fourth kind of madness, which causes him to be regarded as mad, who when he sees the beauty on earth, remembering the true beauty, feels his wings growing and longs to stretch them for an upward flight, but cannot do so, and like a bird gazes upward and neglects the things below. My discourse has shown that this is, of all inspirations, the best and of the highest origin to him who has it or who shares in it, and that he who loves the beautiful, partaking in this madness, is called a lover. For as has been said, every soul of man has by the law of nature beheld the realities. Otherwise it would not have entered into a human being. But it is not easy for all souls to gain from earthly things a recollection of those realities. Either for those which had but a brief view of them at that earlier time, or for those which, after falling to earth, were so unfortunate as to be turned toward unrighteousness through some evil communications and to have forgotten the holy sights they once saw. Few then are left which retain an adequate recollection of them. But these, when they see here, are any likeness of the things of the, that other world, are stricken with amazement and can no longer control themselves. But they do not understand their condition because they do not clearly perceive. Now in the earthly copies of justice and temperance and the other ideas which are precious to souls, there is no light, but only a few approaching the images through the darkling organs of sense, behold in them the nature of that which they imitate. And these few do this with difficulty. But at that former time, they saw beauty shining in brightness, when with a blessed company, we following in the train of Zeus and others in that of some other god, they saw the blessed sight, and vision, 
and were initiated into that which is rightly called the most blessed of mysteries, which we celebrated in a state of perfection, when we were without experience of the evils which awaited us in the time to come, being permitted as initiates to the sight of perfect and simple and calm and happy apparitions, which we saw in the pure light, being ourselves pure and not entombed in this which we carry about with us and call the body, in which we are imprisoned like an oyster in its shell. Okay. So, Wow. We were going to stop on that paragraph before, but since he was reading so well, I figured we'd just go on through it. Right on through it, Now, let's just generate a whole bunch of questions. Thank you for your reading. Thank you. Jump, come on, jump in. Oh. Okay, I'll, I'll throw one or two in. Oh. <clears throat> Matter of fact, it's in, it's in one of these. Page three. Why does he pick on these three? Anything? about it makes it um, other than caprice I mean is it like why does he use those instead of courage and high mindedness or all of the other different kind of virtues what, what makes it uh, why does he pick on those the goal? What's the goal in this work? Right, the region above the heavens. What is it he's encountering? No, the journey to it. See, it's the same word. Usia, it's the same word. So that's why the word is so important in this work. So it's in the soul, but what does he want to do? The goal is to see it purely in itself. Right? Purely. Colorless. Formless and tangibly, truly existing. Well, that's, that's the goal. That's the nature of the soul. But it's not in the soul. Now we're seeing it purely.
This is therefore offering an explanation of why we're not seeing into the nature of ultimate reality. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was very clear. That's what you're saying. Oh, it's I'm about time to... someone dealt with that theme. Yeah. Instead of urging people to get to it, he's going to explain why they don't. So therefore, what we should, we should be able to say, wow, now we can put together an account of our blindness. And it's cure. And it's cure. Remedy. Oh, this ought to be good. I mean, uh, let me check. Uh, Do you know anyone who's interested why they're not... uh, Seeing into the nature of ultimate reality? I've met a couple of people like that. Oh, yeah, well, maybe we can use some of this and pass it around. Bottle it. Sell yeah. It. Well, okay. Uh-huh. It's an account of the blindness. We turn away from the light. How about the remedy? Those were oh, we should break it up, shouldn't we? Yeah. The remedies of what beauty, goodness, wisdom, those things which nurture the wings. Are you using these words? Memory. What for? Because those things are nurturing the wings of the soul, he said. So what's missing in the book? You see. I like the way you're proceeding, but you know what? I was hoping that no one would mention the fact that I'm not really clear what he means by temperance. Really? But I'm sure you do. Um. Right? Agree? Yeah. yeah, okay, we'll skip that. What do you mean by... And look here, what do you does agree? Does have anything to do with them? Uh, How about justice? I mean, what's that got to do? Why should that be in here? Okay, I just thought I'd ask that. Okay. okay. I'd add that because I'm sure it's clear to everyone else but me. No, it's even worse. No. How come those are qualities of the colorless, formless, truly existing essence? Knowledge, justice, and temperance. Yeah. He's in the realm of colorless, formless, truly existing essence, and he, he, he beholds justice itself. Right? Pure knowledge and temperance. How can that be the case? Those must be the qualities of that mystical experience you were talking about earlier. Uh-huh. The terms used to describe it. Well, okay. If so, so. wait a minute, watch. If so, we have two choices. Either he explains it within this story, or we have to go into another dialogue, and therefore he's kind of cheating on us. Yeah, I hope for the first. Being tricky. Uh, Tricky, we'll call it tricky rather than in some way cheating. Is that right? Right, agree? Okay, all right. right. Mm -hmm. Well, he's making us do more homework. Okay, look at it. Would you agree then? We should be able to do this. <whistles> Give some account, and equally well, up and down. We have to account for both. Jump in. God, we need help. <laughs> no, I was just uh, approving. <laughs> I was just approving of needing both. Like that. Mm-hmm. It's dialectic. Jump um, in. Are you interested in, in getting that vision? Mm-hmm. And what keeps you from it? According to this, we should be able to know, shouldn't we? Uh, yeah. Should be a remedy, shouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, good, 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 good. Yeah. Remedy 249B7. Mm-hmm. 
For a human being must understand a general conception formed by collecting into a unity by means of reason the many perceptions of the senses. And this is a recollection of those things which our soul once beheld when it journeyed with God, and lifting its vision above the things which we now say exist, rose up into real being. Yeah. Okay, look. Would you agree that, that uh, there's a division in that long sentence and you know it's mistranslated. Why? Because it's profound. Yeah. Right. We know in principle that any time there's something profound going on, there's going to be a screw up. <laughs> right? I mean, excuse it's me. Absolutely the truth. But the, in this case, it's probably an exception. You think so or not? No. <laughs> oh. oh. Because would you not agree? Literally, if he's right about the first part up to the semicolon, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first part has nothing to do with the second. What do you think? For a human being must understand a general conception formed by collecting into a unity by means of reason the many perceptions of the senses, right, of the senses. The senses. Yeah, yeah. Does that continue with that theme as it proceeds? And this is, there ain't no senses going on in what follows. And this is a recollection of those things which our soul once beheld when it journeyed with God and, and lifting its vision above the things which we now say exist rose up into real being. So you know there's something wrong. Um, it's possible people watching them. Sneak a look. Sneak a look. Yeah, that's it. That'll do it. <laughs> so they're saying we need to recollect these particular qualities within ourselves to reach the, to reach our own godhood. The usia of knowledge, the usia of justice and temperance. Here, let's see. How we, how we, hey. yeah. Would you agree there are a bunch of senses we have? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's he saying? <clears throat> you got to pull all of them you together. Pull all of them together. Give them up. Right? Five senses. Right? For a human being must understand a general conception formed by collecting into a unity by means of reason the many perceptions of the senses. Right? So he's going to have many perceptions of the senses. I don't know why my drawings of the moon are always more accurate than my pictures of the sun, of the stars. <laughs> but okay, okay. No, no. Is this what's going on since he says he's now explaining that? And this is a recollection. Right? To Lifting its reason. vision above the things which we now say exist, that's the realm of the senses. We're calling the senses what we what exists. Yeah. And we pull that up and put it into the... Yeah, but it doesn't fit. No. Yeah, that's why we know it's screwed up. Right? And that's why there's carpentry. <laughs> Is that true? I love it. <laughs> Okay, see, when I try to give my opinion what happens, nothing happens. You have to explain yourself. You look, look at the seed. The conclusion that follows from that, and therefore, it is just that the mind of the philosopher only has wings, for he's always, as far as he's able to communion through memory, the, those very things, the communion which causes God to be divine. Yeah, that shows he's collecting things into a unity from the senses, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. So, it's work, it's work, it's work. It's work, it's work. Conferring. Yeah.
I'm trying to understand what the two toe is referring to. Uh, sorry, the, what the, the this this is a recollection. It's a uh, it's a relative. Um, what do you call those? Remembering the source. Pronoun. Pronoun, right? It's a, it's a neuter, neuter relative pronoun. This it, it, and it's and it's. Um, See, it ends. Equivalent it, with. Memory. It ends with an explanation of what he's talking about. That's his introduction to memory. This is anamnesis. And memory plays a key role from now on. <coughs> The man, it's the, isn't the man gathered and moving out of the senses, or what? There. Man, anthropon. He's forgetting them. He's, he needs to forget them and move onward. And well, this no, is, no, what, this is a great question, said. sir. Sure it is. I know you're wearing glasses and all that. I wear glasses because the doctor said I need glasses. <laughs> so that, that, I always wear these. <laughs> <laughs> it works out. That's not a man. <laughs> works out very well for me. Mm. Well, Pierre. Yes. <laughs> in in the end of the dialogue where he talks about collecting particulars under a general idea and speaking the truth about things, he's referring to. Uh, oh, I just lost my quote. Oh, he's no, referring no. to tr to. Uh, he's referring to ch ah, yes. justice and beauty and goodness. Mm. He's not referring to things, perceptions of the senses, but those perceptions. And therefore? And therefore, um, we have a right when he's having a recollection, he's trying to pull together justice and beauty and goodness. Yeah. And he's going to then go from that, uh, uh, what? He's reasoning it into a oneness. Right? And then he's going to, that will be a recollection of the things which they beheld which fits with the journey. You see, while we're doing this, we want to see, hopefully, that all of these words really are necessary. Mm -hmm. That would be good. And why some in some places yeah. and some in other yeah. places. Yeah. Right. Like Otherwise, quiet. we're going to laugh all the way home. Miss, our, miss, yeah. miss the point of the whole... Exercise. Did you say goodness? I did. So, so you're, you're saying that he's pulling, he's basically he's pulling those justice, beauty, and which one? Goodness? Goodness. From the senses into a un, into a oneness. Well, no, I wasn't actually saying from the senses. I stay oh. on can refer either, either it, can, it can mean perceptions, right? Oh. But if a perception of justice, it doesn't, I don't think necessarily mean something you see with your eyes. Oh, I like that. Right? right. Mm -hmm. But rather, it would could be a, of a state of mind, right. or right? Mm -hmm. something of that nature. Was where mm -hmm. I was going with it, mm -hmm. like the study of music in the Republic. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So it's the form that you're pulling out of your senses, gathered all together. Mm -hmm. Just ignoring it. That's where I was going. You see, it doesn't solve the problem of why justice, beauty, and goodness. Yeah. Why knowledge, justice, and right. temperance, and why wisdom, beauty, and what is the third Good. that you see yeah. in the in the? Uh, and why this whole this whole section is an honor of memory. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So we oh. have to put that as well. So we're not doing very well as I expected. <laughs> <laughs> I expect you all. I expect you guys to do more work, so I can, you know, make notes, and the next time I teach the class, I can look good. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, hey, you know that. Up you know to that? page two fifty, then. Okay. Two fifty. Here. That's the fourth kind of madness. That's if we can go back to the beginning, we can put different sections in the way in which she begins the whole speech. The whole speech is a study of four kinds of madnesses. Mm -hmm. Hey, Pierre. 
You know the word that's used for understand a general conception? Is that same one, Sunesis, from, uh, from the book of Mark? Sunesis, right, to like throw together. The book of Mark? Yeah, this, I, this word for, uh, for a human being must understand a general conception, it's sunienai, right? That dynamic throwing together, sort of. I don't and know. therefore, you would recommend that we kick out there and put in its place? No, 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 I like that. It, oh, oh, oh. And I think it's got a profound use in the book of Mark, too, right? Uh, you, you clued me into that one. Time. Okay, what would you like to put alongside of it so that other people can share in what well, you're saying? Well, yes. Um, uh, so, a man, is necessary that a man must throw together, must understand. Uh, What does let go of no one go with there? And so that's that let go of no one that means gathered together, is that correct? What about a confluence? It looks like the gathered together is the same you Right, but what the, what's the what's the middle passive let go of no one doing? Okay. Let, let, let me then add something, all right? That's what we were talking about. This is either a bad mistake as we mind. usually find in Plato. Right. Sir? This, is, this is either a bad mistake, that kind that we usually find in Plato, or um, he's got to make sense of it. Yes. I'd go for the or part. You'd go for that? Yeah, 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 yeah. If so, then, um, the whole thing there in that curious sentence is must understand by means of reason. Right. It's actually by reasoning. Right. Mm -hmm. right. For a human being must understand blah, 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 blah. It's almost my... By means of reason something, blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Because where he's going, see, this whole work has got one interesting model, right? And that is the love between man and woman is going to be the model for this whole mystical philosophy. And would you agree, if you're talking about men and women, you're sooner or later going to talk about the senses? True enough. Yeah. Did you hear about my friend Harry Dravidovich McGee, when he was asked about his beautiful girlfriend? He, he couldn't bring into a unity, by means of reason, all the senses that he used when he was uh, viewing his girlfriend. So you think he really means... Uh... Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> Forget him laughing at a good, serious point. <laughs> hmm. So you think he really does mean only the perceptions of beauty? Or does mean the perceptions well, of Well, apart from... I was just telling a story about a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Harry Dravidovich yeah. McGee. <laughs> well, what would he... What, his twin was a dope. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, but what Harry kind of dope no one was able to figure out. But in any case, he was a dope. What? Harry doesn't sound that much better at this point. So in what does dopeness lie? His brother was trying to tell him the problem you're having is because you don't understand something. And you have to use reason to understand it. And you've got to pull all of these things together into a unity. He was seeing them separately. Hmm. Yeah. All these things he's saying... And that may be the issue that's coming up in love. Huh. Which is where we're going. Oh, that's cool. Maybe. Not bad. Maybe. And all these things are perceptible through the senses. Right? I hope so. <clears throat> that would give us beauty. See, you have to understand. Through, ba -da 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 -da. through reason. Do -do 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 -do. You two things. Yeah. Why don't we take a break? Don't we? Yeah. We're working longer than we usually do, isn't it? What are we fooling around you know taking so much time? Here. Um.
working gathered. overtime. <laughs> Watch this. Gathered together, moving out from the senses into one. Moving out of the senses. Yeah. Isn't that okay. there? Good heavens. Gathered we're, together. We're getting out close out to understanding. Into one. <laughs> oh. That's moving out, out of the senses. senses. Yeah. It's, oh. it's there. The, Amy, Amy, Evo. Usually, you can't. Usually, you can't find a mistake with one of, in one of these Greek translations because the translators were English, <laughs> and the English never make mistakes. They never make a mistake. <laughs> yeah, and they go to these great schools. Is that right? That is. Okay. Yes. Let's take a break. Okay. In honor of memory, a kind of which I have. I have now spoken at some length through yearning for the joys of that other time. But beauty, as I said before, shone in brilliance among those visions. And since we came to earth, we found it shining most clearly through the clearest of our senses. For sight is the sharpest of the physical senses. The wisdom <laughs> is not seen by it, for wisdom would arouse a terrible love. If such a clear image of it were granted as would come through sight, the same is true of the other lovely realities. Is that a great prayer? Huh? Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where? So, uh, did I tell you that we all agreed before you got here that everyone has to memorize this paragraph before they come in next time? This one, right? The one you just read? It's a great, isn't it? A great paragraph. <coughs> Right. Uh, we're lucky, aren't we? We're lucky that uh, we <laughs> we can't see wisdom <laughs> the way we see physical objects. But why? But a philosopher can. It would arouse. It would arouse a terrible it love. Here, a philosopher right. can. They'd go bananas, wouldn't they? No. There goes one of those guys going banana. crazy. <laughs> a banana the other day. Okay. But the philosopher can. Yeah. So this is a, this is a class of self-aggrandizing for philosophers. You guys are terrible. Beauty, as I said before, shown in brilliance in one of those visions. See? A lump. Hey! Hey, did you figure that out in the video? What's up with legomenon, please? Before you leave? I think you have a good idea. You think gathered together is good there, too?